Sure, we want to welcome everyone, especially our witnesses, who I think we just saw you. Um, so it's great to see you back. Uh, so we've sent seven or eight items over to the Senate uh, to end the Trump shutdown since the new Congress started. And uh, the Senate has done nothing, uh, not, not a thing. Uh, no votes. They haven't moved to amend any of our proposals. Um, it's hard to negotiate with the other body when the Republican majority has completely uh, failed to act. So today, we are trying again, and maybe this time will be the charm. So I'm not going to give a long speech here. I'll just say to the Senate, please do your job. Hundreds of thousands of people need you to act. And with that, I'm delighted and honored to turn the mic over to the ranking member for any remarks he may have. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And what can be bad when you have two such no, superb witnesses yeah. coming before us yet again? So uh, that makes me optimistic. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, first, I want to, uh, again, express my thanks to you and to our witnesses today for, again, coming before us uh, on a matter of great importance. For the third time in three weeks, we're here on the appropriations bill as part of the effort to fund the government and end the shutdown. Unfortunately, I think this effort is just as short-sighted as the majority's previous efforts over the last couple of weeks, and like those bills, the measure today does not address the fundamental issues at stake. Now, let's take a quick look at how we got to this point. In December, the House of Representatives, then controlled by Republicans, passed a bill to fund the government and prevent the shutdown. It included a continuing resolution through February 8th, disaster relief similar uh, in nature to what this committee considered yesterday, and funding for border security to address the very real concerns arising on our southern border. Uh, that was a bill that the majority of the Senate supported and that the President said he would sign. Unfortunately, the Senate uh, minority refused to take up the House measure and parts of the government shut down on December 21st. On January 3rd, when the new Congress was sworn in, the House took up a continuing resolution through February 8th, only this time without the essential disaster relief funding or the additional funding uh, for border security. To date, the Senate has refused to take up this measure, and the President's repeatedly said he would not sign the bill without additional money for border security and additional physical obstacles. Uh, last week, the House took up four spending bills uh, uh, and covered uh, four of the outstanding seven appropriations titles, uh, but did not include any funding for the border wall. These bills uh, were full-year funding bills for uh, relevant departments, but unfortunately, they were Senate-only bills uh, that did not take into account any work of the House of Representatives uh, in the last Congress. They omitted all the uh, work uh, of the House Appropriations Committee, all the work of the conference committees that were attempting to work out differences between the House and Senate bills, and all of the House of Representatives' priorities. Indeed, since the majority chose not to bring those bills to the floor under a closed rule, or excuse me, since the majority chose to bring those rules uh, to the floor under a closed rule, the House had uh, no input at all in the drafting of these measures and we were given only an up or down choice. Although the House passed all four bills, to date the Senate has not taken any of them up. Yesterday, the House attempted to pass a continuing resolution on suspension uh, that would fund the government through February 1st, but again, would not include funding for border security. That bill failed to reach the two-thirds threshold to pass on suspension. Uh, and yesterday, again, the Rules Committee took up a supplemental disaster appropriations bill it was originally intended only to provide uh, just over $12 billion in disaster relief for affected communities. Instead, the Democrats chose to play politics with that and decided at the last minute to attach a CR to the bill again through February 8th. That bill is on the floor today. And today we are again uh, asking, uh, taking up uh, another continuing resolution, this time through February 28th, but yet again with no funding on border security marks the fifth time the new majority is attempting to pass something, anything, that funds the government. But it again marks the fifth time the majority is attempting to pass something uh, that does not provide funding for border security and does not address the very real issues on the southern border. Moreover, we're told that the Senate will not consider the bill uh, and uh, the President will not sign it. Uh, we're now, we see now the common thread in all that uh, the uh, majority is doing bringing up bills again and again to fund the government without dealing with the fundamental problem. Time and time again, the majority seeks to avoid addressing border security, which the American people have told us over and over again that they want and need. And perhaps more unfortunately, time and time again, 
Majority seeks to avoid negotiating with the Senate and the President over, over border security. Mr. Chairman, last week I pointed out uh, to the committee a fundamental truth. The Senate uh, has made clear they will not take up these bills unless the President can sign them. And the President has made clear that he will not sign anything that does not address border security. Given that fact, uh, why does the majority insist on continuing this futile political exercise? Why does the majority insist on putting uh, forward bill after bill that does not represent an attempt to negotiate? And why has the majority continued to bring up these bills under closed rules without any chance for the House to offer its input into the process? Well, I commend, and I mean this quite sincerely, the majority for its desire to end the shutdown. I think uh, this bill and process of bringing the bill to the floor uh, under closed rule remains misguided. And for that reason, I'll, I will oppose the rule and would urge my colleagues on the committee to oppose it as well. And with that, uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. Well, thank you very much. And I just, I, just, I really pre I have great respect for the gentleman from Oklahoma. And I, you know, I, we come, we have come from different political parties. And, but uh, the one thing I, I do um, take issue with is when the gentleman says that we somehow, Democrats somehow are against border security. We don't support border security. We do. We strongly support border security. The issue here is the wall. Uh, it's not, in, not, not more investments in personnel or, you know, in, in upgrading facilities or in, you know, technology. Um, I mean, we favor all those things strongly. Uh, and we have expressed that to the president, and it's been represented in our bills. So we strongly support border security. Uh, we just don't think, uh, you know, investing tens of billions of dollars in a, in a wall that uh, most people tell us uh, uh, is ineffective, um, you know, is, is, worth, uh, is worth doing. You know, Charlie Stenholm, the, uh, our former colleague from Texas used to have a saying, he says, you know, if you, he says, if you build a 30-foot wall, I'll show you a guy who will sell you a 31-foot ladder. Um, and I think uh, there's some wisdom in those words. Uh, and the, on, the only other thing I'm going to say is the fundamental problem now is the, is, is, uh, is, the, is, the, is the government shutdown. We need to reopen the government. Uh, employees at the Department of Agriculture and at the Treasury Department and Interior, I mean, they, sh they, they should not be pawns in this. And we're, I'm sure you're getting calls as, as we're getting calls from individuals who are suffering now. They're, they're not getting their paychecks and they don't understand what they have to do with a wall. And we probably can, you know, come up with uh, some compromises on these appropriation bills that reflect your priorities and our priorities and we can get them through. But you know as well as I do that uh, the stumbling block is the president at this particular point, because our coming to agreement on appropriation bills, as you have all done, um, doesn't solve this problem. And uh, so, in any event, um, I appreciate uh, the, the chair and ranking member of the Appropriations Committee being here. Um, I don't expect you're going to tell us anything different than what you told us yesterday, so we can rewind the tape, if you'd like, and replay yesterday's uh, um, speech. But uh, but I, uh, I I think I we all agree in a bipartisan way up here that the Appropriations Committee works awfully hard, that you did your work, that we're not in this mess because of you, uh, but we're trying to figure out a way to get out of it. And uh, with that, I yield the, the floor to Chairwoman Lowy. First of all, I want to thank you, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Ranking Member, my friends on both sides of the aisle. And um, I just want to say to the Chairman, you express my views, but I can't resist the opportunity <laughs> to share some additional remarks with you. <laughs> Um, in fact, I feel quite confident that you and I and even my friends on the other side of the aisle could probably resolve this in about a half hour. But, uh, Mr. Chairman, I do appreciate the opportunity to come before the Rules Committee to discuss this continuing resolution to reopen the federal government and end the Trump shutdown. As you know, we are now in the 26th day of the Trump shutdown. This past Friday, hundreds of thousands of dedicated federal employees went without a paycheck. So it's truly shameful that the president's stubbornness has forced on the American people the largest, longest federal government shutdown in U.S. history and harmed the financial security of America's public servants. That includes federal law enforcement officials at the FBI, the very Secret Service agents who protect the President, those who work tirelessly to protect our air travel, national parks, environment, and public health. House Democrats have done our job. We passed seven pieces of legislation to end the Trump shutdown 
and get the government back to work for the American people. The continuing resolution would provide an additional option for President Trump and Senate Republicans to finally take yes for an answer and bring the shutdown to its long overdue end. It would reopen the federal government through February 28th, providing time for Congress to come to a full year agreement without jeopardizing vital services or the pay of federal employees. So frankly, my friends, it is long past time for my colleagues across the aisle and across the Capitol to join us to reopen the government, pay our federal employees, and then we can negotiate on border security and immigration policy. So Mr. Chairman, I request an appropriate rule to bring this critical legislation to the floor. We really must end the Trump shutdown without further delay. Thank you very much. Ranking Member Granger, welcome. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Cole, and members of the committee, and we all want to reopen this government. We all agree to that, and there, we have all are receiving the letters from federal employees, TSA screeners, and Coast yeah. Guard defenders, and all those, and telling, and they're very, very uh, disturbing uh, letters. We understand that the workers have families and they have bills to pay, um, and it. We all agree it is vital. We come to an agreement, but this bill isn't going to restart those programs. It's not a comprehensive solution to resolve the government shutdown or fully address the security and humanitarian crisis. I think those are important. That is a security crisis and a humanitarian crisis with thousands of people uh, coming to the border, families, uh, tens of thousands of children, many without parents. I talked before about I've been to the border and, and was asked to go to see what, I, and what was happening, and I did. I went to the countries that those, those families are coming from, and they haven't resolved their safety issues, it's, and they don't have, they have children that are sleeping under their beds rather in the beds because they're shooting through their windows at night. Uh, the situation is unacceptable, and it, it must be addressed. For the security and safety of us and the security and safety of those that are coming to the border, um, we, we all share those concerns, but moving this bill across the floor won't help those employees and it won't solve this. Uh, it's not a bipartisan consensus and that's what we're going to have to have. And it's going to have to be a time where we find common ground on this to provide funds for the border crisis and to reopen the government. I hope we can come to an agreement. I know the people very sincerely in this room, all of those who are making decisions, and pass these bills, want that to happen, none more than me. Uh, I thank you for allowing me to testify. And again, I'm, I'm sorry we're testifying about something that's not going to solve those problems. Thank, right, thank you very much. Thank you both. Uh, Mr. Perlmutter. Thanks, Mr. Chair. I'll just, uh, obviously, I support the rule. I support uh, the underlying bill. Uh, I was saying to the chairwoman that today uh, we've opened our office to federal employees, in effect, an open house, and so that they can come in, understand what resources are available to them uh, in this period where they're not getting a paycheck. And um, so by teleconference, I spoke to four of them today. One from the National Air Traffic Control uh, Administration, two from the National Park Service, and the third was Fish and Wildlife. And they have anywhere from 10 years to 25 years as a public servant for the United States of America. And the young man from uh, NACA, from the air traffic controller, said the same day that he got a certificate from the federal government complimenting him on 10 years of service for the federal government, he also got a paycheck for zero dollars. The other two, the other three uh, really described the stories like you were saying, Ms. Granger, that, that the emotional toll that it's taking, uh, the financial toll that it's taking, the, the fact that they don't know what they considered a very reliable employer being the United States, now being such an unreliable employer. Um, you know, these stories are just, you know, heart-wrenching. And they're the people we, who support us and we support them. So I know, and I've said it, three or four times to Mr. Cole, to you two, uh, 
uh, to my chairman. You guys, we have confidence in the Appropriations Committee and, and the appropriators. You, you make these kinds of decisions on projects and, and issues and prioritizing things every day. That's what you do. And I just ask you all to figure out how to break this logjam. And so we can put these people back to work, which is where they want to be, what we need as citizens. And, uh, you know, I think I, I just pose to, to you too, as well as to the other members of the committee, what could be wrong with opening the government until the end of February so that these people get paid and you all then have the time to get this done. I, I turn to the chairwoman. To the chairwoman? Oh, <laughs> that's been my position all along. This has gone on for 26 days. And if you recall, what we first offered was to pass six bills that passed either the Senate full house or some of the Senate Appropriation Committees. And then we said, which seemed to me so reasonable, 30 days. Let's take 30 days before we pass Homeland Security and get everyone's input and get this done. You are right. It's gone now this for 26 days. Um, it, it doesn't make any sense to me. None of us have all the answers when we're on appropriation. We have healthy debates. Sometimes we agree, sometimes we disagree. But to me, it is common sense that we take the time now to get the, all the expertise we want. I have lists this long from professionals as to what has to be done to keep this border safe. I'm sure my colleague has seen the same list. So let's say to the president, grow up, be an adult, open the government, and let's have a real discussion about what is needed for the border. But keeping this government shut down is childish, not an adult, not the way that we should be operating. I think I've made my position clear. I don't know if the ranking member wants to add, but if not, I'll, I'll yield back to the chair. Thank you. Well, this, the meet, meetings need to occur, discussion needs to happen. It's not going to happen in this room, but it needs to happen. I yield back. The ranking member, Mr. Cole. Thank you very much, Chair, uh, Mr. Chairman. I, uh, and I very much uh, share my chairman's frustration, and I know my ranking member's uh, frustration that we're here yet again. I will say in defense of the House, under both Republican and Democratic control, it's been able to produce a product and get it out of here. Uh, and that's something you should be proud of as a majority. We were proud when we were able to do it. Uh, we actually got ours on the floor in the United States Senate. That, that you'll enjoy that experience when, when you get to have it, and hopefully it'll be sooner rather than, than later. Uh, but we couldn't get the Democratic major minority, minority to help get the 60 votes so our bill, could, which the president would have signed, would have presented all this from happening, over $5 billion, and, and what would have been hundreds of billions of dollars worth of spending. Uh, so I think the Senate minority, uh, you know, bears considerable, uh, you know, uh, responsibility for where we find ourselves now. Uh, I will say, and, and again, I don't know what the level of discussion is um, at the highest levels of both the House and the Senate, obviously with the President, I'm not included uh, in those circles. But what we're doing here has not gotten us one inch closer to where I know we all want to go. Um, but we seem to want to do it over and over and over again. Uh, and uh, all I can tell you is we used to have this problem when my friends controlled the United States Senate. We were in the majority here, and we had a Democratic president, just as we have a Republican president today. And so I've seen this game, you know, from both sides, and I, I understand your frustration. I really do. And particularly understand it in the wake of claiming a majority uh, which you certainly did, and having something that your members feel very much is a mandate. And if all of government could have changed at one time, uh, you would be able to do exactly what you want. You would have a favorable Senate. You would have a favorable president. But our system just not set up that way. It's very – we can change and move very quickly here. We all know this. We live in a majoritarian institution. Um, we try to respect the rights of the minority on both sides of the aisle because we know we each are going to spend some time there. 
And we try and work together, and we can quite often find some common ground, and we certainly do on this committee, thanks in part, frankly, to the leadership of both of you. Uh, but uh, we don't have control of the other side of the rotunda. They have a different set of rules. Their rules empowers the minority. Now, in this case, it's the majority, but whoever knows in the United States Senate for sure. Uh, but uh, nobody can get to 60 over there, so we're all suffering from that. We suffered from it in December. You're suffering from it right now. Uh, and at the end of the day, unless two-thirds of uh, both bodies are willing to override the president, he has to consent to this, too. And I just don't think mathematically there's any likelihood in the near future of Congress overriding a presidential veto. Uh, we certainly were not very successful in doing that again when the roles were reversed. So uh, I would just urge the parties, and this doesn't, certainly doesn't involve either of, of you or anybody in this room, to go sit down again and start talking to one another. Uh, because, uh, again, uh, we can't solve the problem from this chamber, no matter who is the majority. <coughs> nor can this chamber simply insist over and over again to the United States Senate, which is a co-equal branch, that they have to do what we want them to do, uh, nor does the President of the United States. So it, it, this is what discourages me more, and this discourages me a great deal, but what actually does discourage me more is I know how many other big things there are in front of us, as I know my, my friends do. You know, we are going to have to come to a ceiling uh, or spending cap deal or we're going to have sequester, which none of us in this room want to see happen. We're going to have to come to a debt ceiling deal uh, or we'll literally have uh, do something that could collapse the American economy. And all those things are have to have to come in, in short order. So uh, if, if we can't settle the difference over a few billion dollars, it's not – with all due respect to my friends, I know that they like to think of it as a wall. The president likes to talk at it as a wall. It's not a wall. You know, it's a physical barriers. There's not enough money here to build a wall from sea to shining sea, and it would be built where the Department of Homeland Security tells us additional border barriers here make sense. Uh, I am a little concerned when I hear language, and uh, certainly I've not heard this from my friends uh, in this room, but look, if, we, if the if building physical barriers is somehow immoral, then I'm looking for the legislation that will take them all down because we've got hundreds of miles of them. And I haven't noticed anybody advocating that. Let's just take one down. So we're talking about the use of a tool of government that the chief executive thinks is important. Uh, there was a time when the majority of the House agreed with him. It doesn't today, but the majority of the United States Senate still does. So I would just hope uh, the, the parties... Uh, uh, concerned, and that's really the, the speaker, the majority leader, and the president, uh, and their respective uh, counterparts. Obviously, certainly, Mr. Schumer has a great deal of say in this. Uh, you know, sit down and talk. Uh, and I know they've tried on a couple of occasions, and uh, they just don't seem to be getting anywhere. But uh, I hope that they'll reconvene uh, and talk again. And I'm encouraged. I, I noticed uh, I was a little bit discouraged yesterday when. Uh, a number of, uh, of uh, my our colleagues here were invited to the White House, chose not to come, but I saw today some did. I think that's good. I think, you know, I, I think the more talking back and forth that there is, uh, and uh, the members that went down there are members who, very good members, and often inclined to make a deal, that was good. But at the end of the day, we all know it's going to take leadership at the highest level to make <coughs> an arrangement. And so I know you're doing your best to persuade your leaders to do that, we're doing the best to persuade our leaders to do that. Uh, but I also know that doing what we're going to do today is not going to move us one inch closer uh, to a deal. And if anything, my view, uh, it sort of digs everybody in deeper. We have a lot of experience in that on our side, uh, Madam Chairman, because we've done it. Uh, and it didn't seem to change anybody's mind. Uh, so. Uh, I don't think this is going to change anybody's mind either. But uh, I wish my friend well. I thank both our witnesses for being here. Mr. Raskin. Uh, thank you. Did you? Want to... oh, I'm sorry. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so um, I, I don't think there's a, a member of Congress who, if woken up in the middle of the night and asked who's responsible for this situation, would say anything other than President Donald Trump. Um, this really is a one-man show. Uh, President Trump uh, claimed responsibility for it. He owned it. He said he's proud to take it. Uh, Chuck 
And he said, I'm not going to blame it on you. I take responsibility for the shutdown. And so he's taking responsibility for this calamity in the life of our country, where 800,000 federal workers have been told either don't come to work um, or come to work and we're not going to pay you. Um, and I've already told uh, the members of the committee about constituents I have who are air traffic controllers, who are environmental scientists, who are Coast Guard personnel, who are working without pay, or worse, being told they can't come to work. And then they hope they will get paid one day. Essentially, if all goes well, they'll get paid for not having worked when they want to go and serve the American people. And we're telling them that they can't do it. And I've got constituents who are working on E. coli, on salmonella, on insect infestation of foods. I've got people working on climate change. I've got NIH scientists in my district who are dying to go back to work on cystic fibrosis and multiple sclerosis and breast cancer and colon cancer and you name it. I mean, it's, uh, this is having tremendous repercussions um, for us. So at this point, um, the president having done what he's done, I think that there are two positions which are on the table, and now they're on the table pretty much on a daily basis. One says, let's reopen the government, and we can talk about anything. And the other says, do what we, what we want you to do, and then we'll reopen the government. But of course, nobody is going to submit to legislative blackmail and extortion. Nobody is going to accept a political ransom for doing the jobs we've been elected to do. If it were that important to the president, who we know saw Ann Coulter and other talking heads on TV making fun of him, which is why he insisted on the shutdown, but if it were really that important to him, he would have pushed this and advanced it when the GOP was in control of the House and the Senate and the White House. But he didn't. He waited for the Democrats to take control of the House of Representatives after his party suffered a loss by more than 10 million votes and 40 seats in the 2018 election. And that's when he decided, in order to throw a roadblock in front of everything we want to accomplish, that it was a good time to shut down the government of the United States. <clears throat> and Mr. Cole makes a, a very sympathetic, alluring appeal for us to get together. Let's get together. Let's pass what Republicans passed on a vote of 96 to 4 in the US Senate. That's exactly how we started doing this. We said, we will accept your offer. Please take yes for an answer. We will pass exactly what the Republicans asked for, reopen uh, the government of the United States, and then we can continue to talk about border security, which we've invested more than $9 billion in over the last decade. Um, so we, we can get through this thing. We are obviously dealing with one very difficult and quasi-rational actor. And I understand my friends across the aisle must be at least secretly as frustrated with it as we are publicly frustrated with dealing with a semi-rational actor who changes from day to day. He's a political day trader. You never know what he's going to do the next day. Um, so this is a question of institutional self-respect and constitutional integrity. The Congress of the United States is in Article I of the Constitution. We are the lawmaking branch. The President's job is only to take care that the laws be faithfully executed. We create the laws here. Now, I, I've not been around so long as to know exactly how things work. Mr. Cole suggests that, uh, that the different parties get together, presumably not in public, and work this out. Maybe that's the way these things work. I don't know. Uh, my experience as a state senator is the state senate advances the public interest the best that it can. The state house advances the public interest the best it can. If there are differences, they get together and work it out. And so uh, I, I would hope that we would have enough institutional self-respect to do what we need to do, which is to reopen the government of the United States, and then advance all the other legislation that the committee is bringing forward. And let's hope that the Senate does its job, and let's hope that the President does his job. Now, maybe that there could be some kind of uh, massive behind-the-scenes summit that brings everybody together. I don't know. Perhaps it works like that, and th this could be done. But I will tell you, from the standpoint of my constituents, and I think 
from the standpoint of the vast majority of the American people, it makes no sense for the world's first constitutional democracy, the first modern constitutional democracy, the greatest democratic government on earth today, even with this nonsense, it does not make sense for us to shut down our own government and to hold the federal workforce and the people hostage over a policy disagreement. It's just not how we should operate. I Thank yield you. back, Mr. Schumer. I'm happy to yield to the gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Woodall. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I go lots of different places to get hope and inspiration. One is this painting right outside of the summer of 1787 when folks were grappling uh, and they thought all was, all was lost and they ultimately uh, put together the, the finest document of self-governance the world has ever, has ever known. Uh, I confess to you that even under your uh, astute uh, and talented leadership, I do not come to the Rules Committee for inspiration and, uh, uh, and, uh, and optimism uh, these days. And I, I look forward to that changing come, uh, come February. I, I, we've got uh, two of the most talented legislators in uh, Congress sitting in front of us, and there's not a daggum thing. Uh, that uh, we're going to ask them or talk to them about that's going to make a daggum bit of difference in this particular piece of, of, uh, of legislation and the process that, uh, that is before us. My, my friend from New York said, let's, let's reopen the government and then we can start talking about border security. I, I don't want to uh, uh, put words in her mouth, but my guess is they've been talking about border security on the Appropriations Committee long before today, long before 2019, long before uh, fiscal year uh, 2019, that it's, it's a topic that comes up day in and day out. I know my friend from Texas uh, has been a, a leader, not just on, on, on uh, border security, but on national uh, security issues, issues that come together and, uh, and unite us. I don't know where, the, where this exercise in, uh, uh, in futility uh, takes us, but I do know this. Um, if, if I don't hear the word temper tantrum one more time, uh, uh, I'd, I'd be pleased. If I don't hear the President of the United States impugned for his leadership on this issue, I'd be pleased. I don't dispute for a moment that the gentleman uh, from Maryland has constituents who are suffering, as do I. Now, they're not my constituents who work at NIH and CDC because those agencies were funded uh, when this Congress passed more appropriations bills on time uh, than any other Congress in the past uh, 20 years of, of a feat that we credit our appropriators for and, and, and our, us collectively for. But I just want to sh share, a, share this. Jeanette Jenkins, age 76, of Lawrenceville, Georgia, my home, passed away on Saturday, April 28, 2018. Jeanette was a member of Hebron Baptist Church for over 25 years and currently a member of First Baptist Church of Atlanta. Jeanette had a passion for serving in many capacities of the ministry as a Sunday school teacher and volunteering in various activities. She was an avid reader and enjoyed sewing. She is survived by her loving husband of 57 years, Doug. Doug was in my office last week. Jeanette did not pass away of natural causes last April. Uh, she was killed when a gentleman who was in this country illegally ran a red light and crashed into her car. Doug came into my office to say, Rob, this is not a political game. This is not political grandstanding, and this is not somebody trying to make a point. My life is forever changed, not inconvenienced, not uh, created a, 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 a temporary degree of uncertainty, but forever changed, and I want to know who in Washington was responsible for making the rules of who comes and who goes. And candidly, I would say there's more that we agree on than that we disagree on in creating a functioning visa program so we know who's here and who's not here and helping folks come and go in ways that, that make sense. Reopening the government is a serious issue, and in many ways it's an issue of life and death. But border security is also an issue of life and death. And our failures there are not academic failures, and they're not rhetorical failures. They're real failures, and not just in life and death ways in my district, but in each and every one of our districts. We're going to disagree on public policy, but we're going to agree uh, that we all have a common calling to try to get to the right uh, place. And my suspicion is, under new leadership in the House, uh, we're going to get there differently than we would have before, but the foundation will be the same, and that is uh, by agreeing uh, on, our, on our common love of country, 
uh, on our common uh, pledge of service to our constituents uh, and, our, and our shared desire uh, to succeed, uh, that, uh, that foundation of trust is what's going to, uh, to get us there. Uh, if the acrimony gets us there uh, uh, faster, you'd have thought we'd have gotten there by now because we have plenty of it. Um, please, uh, 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 please remember, as, as we're having these, these conversations, the men and women who, are, who want to resolve this issue with more attention focused on border security are not doing so uh, from a place of ill will. Uh, they're doing so from a place of tragedy uh, in many cases, tragedy that falls solely on our shoulders as members of the federal uh, government. I, I, I thank both of you for what you have done. I brag about your successes all the, all the time. If we could build on your foundation of, of, uh, of, uh, of uh, is it uh, seven, is it eight uh, appropriations bills passed? No, it's three quarters of total, total uh, funding. Uh, but instead of seven or eight continuing resolutions uh, passed in, in 2019, if we could build on your foundation of total appropriations bills uh, passed, we could end up in that right place. I, I, I look forward to this being the place of optimism that I, I know our chairman wants uh, to lead it uh, to be, and, and uh, I thank you. Both. I, I would just ask my, my one question, and I'll, I'll ask Ms. Granger. Um, the, the chairwoman did say once we open up the government, then we can uh, negotiate. I don't want to ask her to reveal what's going on in, in her party, so I, I ask you to share the secrets with me. Do we have to wait to negotiate, or, or, or is it still your hope and expectation and desire that those negotiations are, are going on uh, now and we will then see a, a, a package that, that solves have, all of our shared concerns. I have concerns. no knowledge of the negotiations between the people that are absolutely have to be at the table to make a difference. They're not going on right now. And that's a loss. That's a loss. We should, we should be negotiating now at that level. The negotiations among the people who absolutely positively have to be at the table to make the deal are not going on right now. I yield back. <clears throat> If I may, I've been trying to keep the process moving and not commenting, but to answer your question, for those of us who have dealt with border security, and we have people on the subcommittee that is led by Lucille Roy Bell Allard, there is a great deal of knowledge from experts as to what makes outstanding border security and I don't think we'll discuss this today. All I am saying is, as I said quite a while ago, let's keep the government open. We could resolve the issue in an adult way and not cause so much suffering. I don't know about you, I have friends calling and saying, is it safe to take a plane? People are living paycheck to paycheck. Not everyone has money in their bank account. So I would just strongly suggest the government be open. We all support opening the government. The president should not shut down the government and keep it shut down. And then I have real confidence that our committees could work out border security that all rational people could support and those who are expert in that area could support and we could just move on. Let's open the government. You don't blackmail people. People who are told not to go to work and they have families to support. They, uh, th this I, is immoral, frankly, I, I in know my I yield judgment. back my time, Mr. Chairman. Oh, you, you would, if you would indulge me, I, I, I hope that the chairwoman didn't miss my point. If, if you believe that our solution is going to be predicated on a foundation of calling people immoral and blackmailers, you are experiencing a different form of self-governance than I am. That, that's, not, that's not the way I have seen your leadership play out. I see your leadership play out in, in, in a very gracious uh, way that is, is, is from a position of, of shared values and shared ideals. And the, it, it, is my, it is my fear that too many uh, Americans, whether here in this chamber or elsewhere, uh, believe that the more folks we can label as immoral, the more folks we can label as blackmailers, the more folks we can uh, 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 impugn, uh, the faster we will come to a solution. Um, that's not the way my family life works. That's not the way my professional life works, and I don't think that's the way our, our civil society is going to work uh, either, and I, I, I hope we'll, we'll, we'll turn that. Uh, turn that. Well, maybe I can be more positive. 
And I could say that I have confidence that if left to the Homeland Security Committee, Democrats and Republicans, we could come up with a really strong Homeland Security bill. But it doesn't have to come at the expense of people who can't get their paycheck, people who can't go to work, people who can't feed their families, people who have to go to feeding centers. I, if I didn't make my point clear, I don't think the appropriate way for adults to get to a conclusion when you have a challenge, when you have a problem, is shutting down the government and causing such pain. But I yield back. So, yeah. Doug's family was failed by uh, both Republican leadership and Democratic leadership, not just over a year, but over decades uh, at, the, uh, at the border. Uh, and uh, he uh, is not pointing the finger of blame at one party or another. Uh, he's asking that we all come together uh, to prevent another family from experiencing what his family is, uh, is still going through uh, now, even nine months later. I yield back. Ms. Torres. Um, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, and thank you um, to the chairwoman and ranking member for coming here again. I hope to see you every day until we open up the government, and I hope that that's not for too long. Um, there is uh, something that I would say immoral about how this is playing out. There was an agreement. There was an agreement that had been made um, with this president. And that agreement passed out of the Senate. Unfortunately, we did not have the leadership in the House to take that up before the 115th Congress went home, before the 115th Congress got fired and went home. Let me correct that statement. So, this is where we are, and I agree, trading insults and, um, to one another doesn't get us to where we need to be. I, 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 I totally get that. And if it takes throwing ourselves to your mercy to open up the government and pay 800,000 people what they deserve, then let's do it. We do not need the White House. We do not need the leadership. We can do it. Members like you and I can grow the backbone, and we can overturn a veto. We can do it. We have crises all over the country. Opioid. Opioid in your backyard, my backyard. The four opioid in my backyard was crack and cocaine. That's a major crisis. Mass shootings, it's been a major crisis. Democrats had had to stage a sit down on the floor because we could not, we have not addressed the issue of mass shootings. The homeless epidemic in all of our communities, I call those major crisis in the U.S. and our territories. But here we are, stuck on an issue at our southern border, where the solution for that problem lies in the northern triangle. And addressing those root causes, there's a reason why children are fleeing their homes, why parents, like my parents, have to make those difficult decisions to send their children north. There's a reason, and it's called public corruption. It is called drug cartels. We can do something about that. We had been doing something about that, but we've relaxed our insistence of these governments moving in the right direction. And because we have not been paying attention, they're going back to their ways. And things are getting worse. And if you think things are bad right now in the southern border, it's only going to get worse unless we refocus our efforts. 
I really want to make a plea to my colleagues and say, let's pay our employees and let's work on the deep-rooted causes of the problems that we have at our southern border. Whatever it takes, let's do it. You don't want to move this direction. I don't want to move that direction. We can talk about that. But employees cannot continue to not get paid. Electricity is going to be cut off in 14 days. It's cold outside. Their water is going to get shut off. Cell phones will be the first thing to go. So where are they going to get a call to? Those are some of the things that we really need to think about. Last year, the government was shut down three times. We, have, we can't allow this to happen, to continue to happen. That is not a way of doing business, not for this global leader that we call the great United States of America. So let's work together, let's come together, let's open up the government, and then let's work on a comprehensive solution that deals with the Northern Triangle and how that is impacting our southern border. And with that, I hope that we would approve once again the rule on this bill and we send it to the Senate and we hope that they can get it out. And I yield back. Thank you. Mr. Burgess. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, just again, going back to last September, we. We did pass a number of appropriations bills, and they passed both houses of Congress and were signed by the president and before the uh, end of the fiscal year. And I thought we were on a pace to pass all of the appropriations bills. The, the hardest one always had been labor, health, and human services, probably because of the subcommittee chairman at the time it was difficult to manage. But nevertheless, uh, it got done, paired with defense, and that was a, that was a big lift. Um, I know a lot of people that I represent were concerned about the amount of money that was spent in order to get the Defense Department appropriated, but Secretary Mattis had come to us and said, I need $700 billion last year and $716 billion this year. And, uh, Chairman Thornberry and the Armed Services Committee at the time had said we were going to fund defense to the amount that Secretary Mattis has requested, and indeed it happened. And I think we, we can all be proud about that. I was not certain why we didn't proceed with the rest of those bills, but my understanding is from the House appropriator's standpoint, those bills had been completed and the work had been done. And the difficulty, as always, is getting 60 votes over in the Senate. And that's not 60 Republican votes, that's 60 bipartisan votes, because no party holds, at this point, a, a 60 vote majority in the Senate. So the reason for not moving past that point in September, which I thought was a, a wonderful opportunity to, to actually get this work done and not have it continue on our plate into the next fiscal year, as has happened so often in the last 10 or 15 years' time, we had an opportunity for that not to occur. But the lack of an agreement with senators, I shouldn't say senators, members of the other body in the minority, Members of the body and minority would not agree to the spending levels in the bills that you all had passed, and I thought were were good bills. Um, then in December, um, someone made the statement down at the White House that, uh, Mr. President, there aren't 217, 218 votes for this uh, appropriations bill with the House of Representatives, and I don't know why the Speaker hesitated at that point and didn't bring the bill up, but we did finally on the 20th of December, and it passed with 217 votes. Problem once again, over the other body, you've got to have 60 votes on an appropriation, which I wish they would change, and I've made that point on several occasions, but uh, for whatever reason, the Majority Leader in the Senate wants to adhere to the historic rules that have always been in place, or at least been in place for most of my lifetime, 
and that is a filibuster uh, requires 60 votes to retire a filibuster. So they were unable to move forward, and that brought us to where we are now. Now, it's my understanding, and I have not been part of the uh, big negotiations down at the White House. I wasn't in the Situation Room earlier. I think it was this week. I do believe it was reported that the President of the United States asked the new speaker and the current minority leader of the other body uh, if I agree to open up the government for 30 days, is can I expect that you will work with us on getting an answer to the question of border security? And he was flatly told no, that there is no deal to be had because we're not going to make a deal. So it, you can see that that would disincent uh, the current Senate majority leader or the majority leader of the other body um, and the President of the United States would disincent them from, from making an agreement to go ahead with a 30-day, because then we're just going to be back in the same standoff in 30 days' time, and nothing will have been gained. I do think there is a way forward. I do think that, uh, and I frankly do not understand why the current Speaker of the House will not enter into a good faith negotiation. The President said, I want to know what you will provide for border security. And the answer is one dollar. That doesn't seem like a reasonable response from, we've talked about people behaving with maturity, that doesn't seem like a reasonable, mature response. I gotta tell you, Mr. Woodall told a story that was very, very compelling. Um, I don't know if the president, as it stands today, there's some question as to whether or not the invitation for the President to address joint session of Congress at the end of this month to deliver the State of the Union. Um, it should happen. It, it should not be interrupted, but I, I do know there's been some controversy surrounding that. Um, the individual that I've invited to the State of the Union tells a very similar story to Mr. Woodall. Um, gentleman came in to see me in 2015. Um, said, Congressman, I just have to tell you, I um, am a veteran. I put on the uniform of my country and went to serve my country and was serving in Iraq. And my wife got sick and developed cancer. And I was allowed to come home and unfortunately, she couldn't be safe and she died. And there I am, a recently discharged veteran and a, now a single father. I've got a 12-year-old daughter and I'm doing my best to raise her. And she asked to go on a sleepover one night. And he didn't want her to go, but he hated to always tell her no. So he agreed. And while she was at a friend's house on a sleepover, they went out one evening and crossed the street, and she was hit by a vehicle and died. The vehicle was being driven by a man who was in the country without the benefit of citizenship, without a social security number, without being documented. And it turns out it wasn't the first time that he'd been, that that had happened. Um, turns out he had multiple speeding tickets in his background, but there were no drugs, no alcohol in his system. And the DA of that county, which is not a county that I represent, but the DA of that county said, well, there's nothing to be done and, and we're not gonna hold the individual. So. Chris comes in to see me, actually it's now 18 months after, and he's at his wit's end. And he said, Congressman, I volunteered to serve my country. I put on the uniform, and I fought for my country. I lost my wife while I was serving, so my time that I might have had with her at the end of her life was limited because I was in service. And then I've lost my daughter, but he said, Congressman, it strikes me. I did my job. If you'd been your, doing your job, my daughter would still be here. And your job was to defend the border. And I'll tell you, that's, that's tough to take. Now, again, I don't know what the State of the Union address will be allowed to happen or not. I have invited Chris to be my guest at the State of the Union. I, I hope it all works out. I know that won't make up for him what, what his loss has been, but it is, uh, just like Mr. Woodall, it underscores to me the importance of this task that is in front of us. And when the president says he wants to defend the border, I believe him. 
And I want him to. And I know Chris wants him to. And that's all we're saying. Why wouldn't the speaker provide an opportunity for there at least to be a further discussion if the president went ahead with the 30-day opening of the government? But he was flatly refused. Again, that doesn't seem like a responsible way to proceed with this. Mr. Chairman, I regret we are where we are. Uh, I think we know the outcome of today's vote on the Rules Committee, and we know the outcome of the vote on the floor. So I'll yield back my time, and we can proceed. No, and I appreciate the gentleman's comments. I just, again, want to point out, uh, because I think it's, a, it's an important distinction here. Uh, when the gentleman said that the Speaker uh, wouldn't even support $1 for border security, uh, Democrats have supported uh, a robust border security plan uh, and work with appropriators on both sides of the aisle to do that. We have four border security. Uh, we have four increased technology, increased infrastructure, uh, putting more personnel at the border. I mean, uh, using technology, it's the 20, you know, in this day and age, you know, we have things like drones and, and sensors that can detect movement and, and we can respond uh, much more effectively. Uh, and so it's not about border security. Uh, so that's not the case. And, and one other thing in terms of the State of the Union, um, I think the, the, the speaker's letters, if I read it properly, that, that she welcomes the president to come here when the government is reopened. Uh, but the very people who are charged to protect the president and to protect all of us during the State of the Union, we all know all the security that is up here, uh, are not being paid. Uh, and so uh, this is not a time for business as usual. We reopen the government, everything goes back to you know, normal, and the State of the Union will occur on the day it's supposed to. Uh, Ms. Matsui, do you have? I just have a couple comments. First of all, I associate myself with the Chairman's remarks. And um, I'd just like to say that we can have this discussion about border security and everything else, but we still need to open up the government. It goes beyond the 800,000 employees. It now is affecting so many businesses beyond that, the services that these people provide. You know, in Washington, we get focused on the employees, but if you go outside of Washington, you really hear from the senior citizens about perhaps them losing their housing because HUD is not paying, uh, the, doing the services they need to do. You know, you'll hear about FDA and the fact that, you know, we may have a problem because they're not doing the services that we need. I was thinking about the fact that we were having problems with romaine lettuce and all of that with some of the inspections, and we can go way beyond that. We really do need to open up the government so we can have a rational discussion. I believe we need to talk about what's happening on the border with security. But if we elevate the um, emotion around that, we are really doing a disservice to our constituents. So I truly believe in order to have a discussion, which I believe all of us want to have, we first need to open up the government. I don't think there's any developed country in the world that shuts down their government like we do. And we're supposed to be leaders of the world. And so I just really believe that we as um, elected representatives really ought to understand that this is something that we really need to do. Um, probably need to talk to our colleagues about this that our first duty is to our constituents. We really do need to open up the government because not only for the employees that we have to pay, but also for all the services that they provide. And if we keep going on like this, it is gonna get way beyond where we are today. So many more people are being affected and we will lose um, the whole sense of why we are here and why it's important that, first of all, we need to provide for our constituents. We can have a discussion once we open up the government. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you. Ms. Scanlon? Thank you. Um, I appreciate the acknowledgement that both sides of the aisle share certain common values. Put your mic on. Yeah. Yep. Oh, right. Oh, yeah. yeah. Maybe. <laughs> yes. So I appreciate the acknowledgement that both sides of the aisle share common values such as love of country and a commitment to border security, um, as certainly the bipartisan votes on appropriations for border security, providing billions and billions of dollars for that over recent years is, is ample demonstration, including in the recent bills passed by the House. I also appreciate the suggestion that trading insults doesn't solve the problem. 
although I would assert that uh, slandering or demonizing our immigrant population and blaming them for all problems that occur in this country is not an appropriate way to address this issue. The fact of the matter is that the failure of the Senate to act and the failure of the president to reopen the government is making all of us less safe. And it completely undercuts the argument that the failure for him to get his money for his wall, and he's been explicit that he wanted a wall, and I believe the rejection of the $1 was not for border security, but it was $1 for a wall. Um, you know, we're less safe now because of the government shutdown, whether it's safety from food products such as romaine lettuce or safety from, you know, these cybersecurity attacks that are not being addressed or the lack of attention to um, diseases or, you know, just border security on our coasts with the Coast Guard. So for all of those reasons, I'm proud that the House continues to try to reopen the government. Um, and I would, again, just wish that the Senate would participate. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Morelli. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I am reminded that uh, in my days in the state legislature, I used to say to my colleagues, everything's been said, just not by everybody. So um, I'll keep it short. I am reminded throughout this, this resolution in front of us, which just funds the government for just a short period of time to allow us to uh, work out our difference, if that's possible, reminds me essentially of a family confronting a uh, kitchen fire, which is going on, and, and rather than grabbing a bucket to put it out of water, uh, someone wants to argue about whether we should have had those smoke alarms in the house. Well, that's probably a good conversation to have, but not right at the moment when the kitchen's on fire. So I would argue, let's put out the fire. I think this was this resolution uh, intends to do, and it'll give us the opportunity to continue to have what I hope will be meaningful dialogue, which brings parties together. But uh, uh, it seems to me we, we ought to do that. It's immediate. Let's do it. Let's get it done, and let's have that uh, more thoughtful conversation over the days and weeks to come. Thank you. Mr. Lalo? Mr. Chairman, um, I didn't come to Washington to hurt hardworking Americans, and uh, I sit in Claude Pepper's seat. He is, yeah. Right there. <laughs> there he is. And, you know, he's watching me. Um, here's what I'm worried about. Um, it's not the broadband of this debate. It's the idea that we could cl we use the closing of government as a weapon when we have policy differences. And the only institution that can take a stand on that is the Congress of the United States. One way or another, this has to be the last closing of the government and hurting people. This institution this House of Representatives has to say to the Senate, and the Senate has to agree, that we will never use policy differences to close the government and to hurt people. Not just the 800,000 federal employees, but their families and the contractors and all the other people in our communities that are being hurt by this. We're using this as a weapon, and we shouldn't, we absolutely should, this is a weapon that we ought to ban. Mm -hmm. And one way or another, at the end of this, when it ends, and it will, we have to figure out a way to ban the closing of government um, because we have policy differences. Um, last night, I was sorting out my books because I wanted to take them to my office, and I came across Profiles in Courage. It is a very small book, and I now know why. Um, but in that book, and I sat and read it um, for uh, uh, two hours, um, are people that stood up, but more than anything else, they believed in the institution. They believed in this institution. They believed in the Congress. And they believed in democracy. But I don't think any of them ever thought about using the closing of government as a weapon when they had policy differences. They lost their seats. They were willing to take big risks. But they would have never thought of this as a weapon of policy making. And that's what we need to end. Thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, I want to thank Ms. Lowy, Ms. Granger, for being here again. And I appreciate all your work. I think I speak for every. Oh, do you, do you want? I'm sorry, I didn't see you come in. Do you want to? Uh, 
Do you have anything to, you want to, Ms. Lesko? I'm sorry. I'm, whatever. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, and thank you uh, to both the appropriation uh, chairwoman and the ranking member of appropriations for being here once again. I do feel uh, that we are like that movie uh, Groundhog Day, where you wake up and the same thing happens every day. <laughs> and so pretty soon I'm going to start dreaming about this, I think, you know, um, all the talking points, because we basically are saying the same thing every single day on every single one of these bills. But I do want to share with you that, as you know, all of our districts are different. And in my uh, congressional district, of the people that have called into my office, 82% of them support a border fence. And uh, as I've said before, because I live in Arizona, I have been down to the border. I am sure some of you have been down to the border. And the thing that I don't understand, uh, and I don't know if you want to respond or not, but when um, my Democratic colleagues say, we definitely support border security, we're for border security, well, so why not listen to the Department of Homeland Security and the Customs and Border Patrol agents who say, as part of border security, we do need a border fence. I mean, I, I guess I don't understand that. And so I am hoping, as I've said before, that we do come to a resolution. Um, I think every single one of us, whether we're Republican or Democrat, want to uh, make sure we get the government open. Um, as I've said before, uh, the Republicans uh, in December did vote uh, to keep the government open, uh, knowing that part of the deal was border fencing. Uh, and so hopefully we can come to some negotiated deal and get this, get this done so we don't have to keep doing these same bills and saying the same thing over and over again. Uh, and it's for the best of the American people. Thank you. Thank you. I should remind you that the Groundhog Day has a happy ending. <laughs> right? he, gets the day, he gets it perfect at the end, right? Yeah. Um, no, and, I, and look, I, I appreciate And we do. We, we, I think we, I speak for the people on our side of the aisle and our leadership. I mean, we do listen to DHS and to others. Um, and we have, many of us have been to the border. Um, and, um, and it's because of that that we have come to the conclusion that, uh, that uh, you know, uh, Constructing a wall that's going to cost tens of billions of dollars that Mexico was going to pay for that now the American citizens are going to pay for is not the best use of our dollars. In fact, we hear over and over and over again that there are better ways to uh, secure the border, and we have supported border security in the past. So I appreciate the gentlelady's comments, and I'm gl glad she made it back to make the comments. And um, and I think everybody we got everybody right. All right. Uh, so I uh, so let me thank. Again, Ms. Lowy and Ms. Granger for being here, and I appreciate your patience and all the great work you do. And we appreciate your leadership. Thank you. Thank you for giving us an opportunity to share our views. Are there any other members who wish to testify on this legislation? Yeah. Seeing none, uh, this closes the hearing portion of our meeting. Uh, at this time, the chair will entertain a motion from the distinguished gentlewoman from California, uh, Ms. Mrs. Torres. Mr. Chairman, I move the committee grant H.J. Res. 28, the Further Additional Continuing Appropriations Act 2019, a closed rule. It, the rule provides one hour of debate equally divided and controlled by the chair and ranking minority member of the Committee on Appropriations or their designees. The rule waives all points of order against consideration of the joint resolution. The rule provides that the joint resolution shall be considered as read and the rule waives all points of order against provisions in the joint resolution. The rule provides one motion to recommit. And finally, section two of the rule provides that it shall be in order at any time through the legislative day of January 25th, 2019, for the speaker to entertain motions that the House suspend the rules as though under clause one of rule 15 and that the speaker or her designee shall consult with the minority leader or his designee on the designation of any matter for consideration pursuant to this section. Um, as we've just heard from the gentlewoman from California, this rule provides for consider consideration of H.J. Res. 28, which provides, um, which would fund the government until February 28th under a closed rule. 
It also provides suspension authority till January 25th. Uh, so you've heard the motion from the gentlewoman from California. Uh, is there any amendment or discussion? Gentleman from Oklahoma. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I have good news for this long-suffering committee. <laughs> Uh, while we will certainly oppose the motion, we have uh, no additional amendments to make. Uh -huh. And, uh, of course, everybody here is entitled to speak, but for myself, I thought the discussion was the debate, so I'm going to yield back my time. Does anybody else wish to add to that discussion? Seeing nobody, then I guess the vote will now occur on the motion from the gentlewoman from uh, California. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, nay? No. no. Opinion that chair the ayes have it? Met, Mr. Chairman, I'd like a roll call on that. We'll call the roll. <laughs> Mr. Hastings. Mrs. Torres. Aye. Mrs. Torres votes aye. Ms. Matsui. Aye. Ms. Matsui votes aye. Mr. Perlmutter. Aye. Mr. Perlmutter votes aye. Mr. Raskin. Aye. Mr. Raskin votes aye. Ms. Scanlon. Aye. Ms. Scanlon votes aye. Mr. Morelli. Aye. Mr. Morelli votes aye. Ms. Shalala. Aye. Ms. Shalala votes aye. Mr. Cole. No. Mr. Cole votes no. Mr. Woodall. No. Mr. Woodall votes no. Mr. Burgess. Mr. Burgess votes no. Mrs. Lesko. No. Mrs. Lesko votes no. Mr. Chairman. Aye. Mr. Chairman votes aye. Clerk will report the total. Nine yeas, eight yeas, four nays. The ayes have and the motion is agreed to. Accordingly, uh, the gentlelady from Pennsylvania, Ms. Scanlon, will uh, manage this uh, rule for the majority. Well, we are delighted that uh, Ms. Lesko will be managing the rule for the minority. Wonderful. Uh, and uh, so I guess that's it. So without objection, the committee stands adjourned. <laughs>